Hi, and welcome to Tutorial 10. In this session, we're going to review how to interpret Poisson regression output. We'll also go over the assumptions of Poisson and common issues with this modeling approach. And then we'll conclude by introducing survival analysis. So we talked about this in the last session, but I'm just going to briefly review it again. Recall that there are multiple ways to look at the same Poisson model. Ultimately, we're interested in modeling the rate, the number of event occurrences in a given time, space, or group. But because the rate has an exponential shape to it, we would need to model this as a log linear function of the x's. We don't want to do that, in part because our interpretations would be complicated. We wouldn't have a simple slope to interpret. So we instead want to model the log rate as a linear function of the x's, shown in the second equation. So we could model the log rate using a line and then exponentiate the coefficients to get rate ratios. This is similar to logistic regression, where we model the log odds using a line and then exponentiate the coefficients to get odds ratios. Technically, we can think of this second equation modeling the log rate as what we're doing in concept. But the third equation, modeling the log expected count using an offset is the way we actually model the log rate with statistical software. An offset is used when we're estimating the rate of event occurrences, but does not need to be used when we just want to estimate a count of event occurrences, because the value of the offset will be the same for all participants in this instance. Modeling the log expected count with an offset is mathematically equivalent to modeling the log rate. And so the way we interpret our output from R is as though we had modeled the log rate. The purpose of an offset is to adjust a Poisson regression model to account for a denominator, a certain exposure that the number of event occurrences is likely dependent on. This is usually person time, but could also be unit of space or number of people per group, for example. Including an offset allows us to account for the effect of differences in this denominator, thereby adjusting for the amount of opportunity an event has to occur in estimating the rate. If this denominator is the same for everyone, then we can just model the count and don't need to include an offset. But if this denominator differs for different participants, then we need to include an offset to allow us to account for these differences in estimating the rate. The offset always has a coefficient equal to 1, which allows it to be on the right or left side of the regression equation. In other words, we can transfer the offset to the left side of the equation to be interpreted as the logged rate. We cannot simply model the rate, like the first equation, because the count, or number of event occurrences, follows a Poisson distribution, and the rate does not. Also, if we just modeled the rate, this would not tell us the amount of exposure the rate is based on. So one event in five person years would be treated the same as 100 events per 500 person years, even though the variability and precision of these rates are very different. So modeling the number of occurrences as the numerator and including an offset as the denominator enables us to get an estimate of confidence associated with the rate that we estimate. We would lose this information if we just modeled the rate or log rate. So let's turn to an example where we're interested in the effect of smoking on death rate, adjusting for categorical age. And this is the equation we get, using smoke and age category as explanatory variables with the log death rate as the outcome. The intercept is negative 7.92. This tells us the log death rate for age category A and non-smokers the reference groups for the two variables in our model. The coefficient for smoke is 0 0.355. This is the difference in the log death rate for smokers compared to non-smokers. We would interpret this coefficient as the log death rate is 0 0.355 higher for smokers compared to non-smokers. One thing to note here is that your output does not give you a value assigned to your offset. Remember that the offset is forced to have a coefficient of 1 so that it can be transferred to and from either side of the equation. 
so you won't see anything about the offset in your output from a Poisson regression model in R. When you're interpreting your output, you can interpret your findings as though you've modeled the second equation, shown on the previous slide, so modeling the log rate as a linear function of the x's. So how would we compare the death rate for smokers versus non-smokers? In the same way we got the odds ratio with logistic regression, we exponentiate our coefficient for smoke in our Poisson output to get the rate ratio. This gives us a rate ratio of 1.43. This would be interpreted as smokers have 1.43 times the death rate of non-smokers, adjusting for categorical age. The next part of the question is to calculate the expected death rate for a smoker in age category C. So we use the regression equation to get the log rate, including the intercept and coefficients for smoke and age category C. This gives us a log rate of negative 4.94. So we exponentiate this to get the rate, which is a quite small number of 0 0.007. If we multiply this by 100,000, we get an expected death rate of 717.4 per 100,000 person years for smokers in age category C. The next question is, we follow a group of 9,783 non-smokers in age category D for 25 years. Based on the model we have fit, how many deaths would we expect? We follow a similar process as we did when we were calculating the rate, but adjust our offset for the number of smokers times the number of years. So 9,783 times 25, which equals 244,575. We then move this to the right side of the equation to get the expected number of deaths, which equals 2,536 deaths. If we follow a group of 9,783 non-smokers in age category D for 25 years, we would expect 2,536 deaths. Let's talk about the assumptions for Poisson regression. The first is that observations are independent. So not only individuals or groups, but also events should be independent. This isn't always the case. For example, if having an event once is going to increase the likelihood of more events, you should not be using Poisson. So if having one relapse increases your likelihood of having a second or more relapses, you should not use Poisson. The second assumption is that the event rate is a log linear function of the x's like with logistic regression. Another way of saying this is that the log rate is a linear function of the x's. The third is that changes in explanatory variables have a multiplicative effect on the number of event occurrences. For example, for two people with the same combination of explanatory variables, known as a covariate pattern, the person with a follow-up time of five years is expected to have five times the number of occurrences as the person with a follow-up time of one year. The fourth assumption is that for each covariate pattern, the mean equals the variance, which is equal to the rate or lambda. We'll talk more about this in a minute. Finally, Poisson regression assumes that the rate is constant and tries to estimate it. So we're assuming that the rate does not change. This is not always true and may not always be a realistic assumption. For example, the likelihood of relapse may decrease over time. There are two common problems with Poisson regression. The first is overdispersion, where the variance is greater than the mean. The second is zero inflation, where there are excessive zeros, so many people do not experience the event. A common problem in Poisson regression is overdispersion. For this course, you need to know what this means how to check for this, and possible solutions for this problem. So we've just discussed how Poisson models assume that both the variance and the mean equal lambda. These are all the same. With linear regression, the estimate of the mean, the regression line, and the variance, the mean squared error, are separate. But these are the same with Poisson, which assumes or forces the variation to increase as the rate increases. But sometimes the variance is greater than expected in a Poisson model. So the variance is greater than the mean. This is known as overdispersion. Overdispersion occurs when there is greater variability or statistical dispersion 
in the data set than expected by the model. So the variance is greater than the mean, even though our model assumes that the variance equals the mean for a given set of x values. Over dispersion tells us that our estimate of the standard errors may be too low. The deflated standard errors resulting from over dispersion mean that we have exaggerated levels of precision associated with our estimates, increasing the likelihood of a type 1 error, so incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually true. Over dispersion often occurs when relevant explanatory variables are not included in the model, the functional form of the model is incorrect, so for example, there's a nonlinear association rather than the linear association modeled, or over dispersion may occur when strata of a variable are assumed to be homogeneous but are not. So we might be missing effect modification. For example, maybe we model a group like smokers as a homogeneous group, but there might be subgroups of smokers like exercisers and non-exercisers that have different rates. You can calculate dispersion by either dividing the Pearson's chi-square by the residual deviance degrees of freedom, or by dividing the residual deviance by the residual deviance degrees of freedom. The difference between the two is not important. This is the code for calculating the dispersion in R. You want the dispersion to be roughly equal to 1. Larger than 1 implies over dispersion, and less than 1 implies under dispersion, which is less common but can exist. What is larger than 1 is subjective. So for example, if dispersion equals 1.2, it's probably okay to say that there is no over dispersion. As a very rough guideline, greater than 2 is when over dispersion becomes a real issue. There are a few potential solutions for addressing over dispersion. The first solution, which is not listed here, is to find the correct functional form or further examine and include all important explanatory variables and interaction terms. But if over dispersion is still a problem after you try these things, there are a few potential solutions. The first is to estimate the dispersion parameter. As I mentioned, the dispersion parameter is the model residual deviance divided by the residual deviance degrees of freedom. Once you've estimated this, you can then scale the standard error of each model coefficient by the square root of the dispersion parameter. This will not change the estimates, but will make the standard errors larger to account for the variance in the observed being larger than expected. The second is to fit a model using the quasi-likelihood function, which is a similar solution to solution one. The third solution is to fit a negative binomial model. This estimates the rate and standard error separately and allows the variance to be larger to, but proportional to the mean. This more accurately estimates the variance because the variance is actually larger than we assume it to be in the regular Poisson model. The first and second approaches will give the same coefficients, whereas the third approach will give you slightly different estimates. So solving the problem of over dispersion more accurately estimates our variance. When we initially have the problem of over dispersion, the variance is actually higher than what we assume it to be, so we are correcting for this. This will increase the standard errors to account for the variance in the observed being larger than expected. As mentioned, options 1 and 2 will give you the same estimates as the original model, but will scale the standard error in some way. But option 3 gives you slightly different estimates of the coefficients. Another common issue with Poisson regression is zero inflation. In this case, there are lots of zeros so the event has not occurred for lots of people or larger groups with aggregated data. This usually occurs with individual level data, and usually when the case is that either you do have the outcome or you don't. With zero inflation, there are two processes at play. The first determines whether or not the event occurs. Do you have the event, yes versus no? And the second determines the rate of the events. So there are two groups one that experiences the event, and one that does not. There are two potential solutions to this problem. The first is that we could use logistic regression to predict yes versus no, and then exclude the zeros and model the rate among people who would be predicted to have the event. The other solution is to use zero inflated Poisson, which does both of these two processes at once, 
These are also known as two-part models. This fits a Poisson model for the second part to estimate the rate for the predicted non-zeros. So now let's turn to survival analysis, where our outcome is time to event occurrence. Recall that with Poisson, we are modeling the count or the rate. How many times or at what rate is the event occurring? Poisson has a start and end point, or a fixed interval, and asks about the number of event occurrences within that interval. So time is fixed, and we are wondering how often did the event occur? For example, we could be estimating the number of deaths per person time. Survival analysis estimates how long until an event occurs. So with survival analysis, we are interested in the amount of time until the event occurs. The event is fixed at one event, and we ask how long until it occurs. For example, how long until death occurs. Poisson regression assumes that the rate is constant, so it does not change, and tries to estimate it. Survival analysis answers how long until the next event occurrence. The rate does not have to be constant with survival analysis. It can accelerate or decelerate. Survival time tells us the probability of not experiencing an event up to a given point in time, or surviving beyond time t. So the outcome has two parts. The first is t, which equals time, and then the second is c, which equals event occurrence, yes versus no. With Poisson regression, we're wondering how many relapses, whereas with survival analysis, we ask how long until they relapse. Poisson and survival analysis are related. For example, let's say we use Poisson to estimate the rate of relapse. And this gives us an average of three relapses per year. With survival analysis, we're asking how long until you relapse in a year. Since Poisson gives us an average of three relapses per year, one year divided by three equals four months. So we would expect that the average time to relapse would equal four months. So why don't we use linear regression instead of survival analysis? The first reason is variable follow-up times. So each individual is contributing a different amount of information. Some people are followed longer than others, so we need to account for this. The second is that change in risk over time is common. For example, the risk of mortality after surgery is non-linear. There's a higher risk immediately after surgery, but then this risk tends to decline over time. Survival analysis allows us to account for this change in risk over time. If everyone's follow-up time was the same, and the risk of the event remained the same over time, we could use linear regression. But this usually isn't the case, so we need to use survival analysis. Over a study period, for example 10 years, each individual contributes a different amount of time and information. So some people will contribute a certain amount of time and will experience an event, and others will be lost to follow up. So there are several types of censoring. Left censoring occurs when we're missing information from before the beginning of a study. So if we're following individuals from when they're diagnosed with a disease until death, left censoring would be when the diagnosis occurred sometime before study entry, and we may not have information on when the individual was diagnosed. So if you picture a graph where you have the start of the study on the left and the end of the study on the right, left censoring is when you're missing information from the left side of the graph. Right censoring occurs when a participant leaves the study or is lost to follow up for a reason other than the event. It could also mean that they survive to the end of the study without experiencing the event. So the study ends before they have experienced the outcome. This could be because they've moved, researchers can't track them down, or the study has just ended and they aren't following them anymore. So you could picture these individuals as missing information from the right side of the graph. Left and right censoring, also known as interval censoring, is a combination of the above. So we're missing information from the beginning and the end of the study the left and the right sides of the graph. One assumption that we're always making when we're using survival analysis is that censoring is non-informative. 
So basically this is saying that the likelihood of being censored or non-censored, so being lost to follow up or not being observed, is not related to the outcome or the probability of the event occurring. So another way to think about this is that those who are lost to follow up are no more or less likely to experience the event than those who are not. There are lots of situations where this assumption doesn't hold. For example, if we're following people over time who are taking a particular drug, if you lose them to follow up because they stop taking the drug, it could be that people who have the worst side effects or worst disease prognosis are more likely to drop out because they are no longer interested in being part of the study. In that case, the assumption of non-informative censoring would be violated. So we're assuming that there's no difference between those who drop out and those who stay in the study in terms of how likely they are to experience the event, even though this often may not be true. Okay, so let's remind ourselves about conditional probability. This is going back to SPPH 400. So if you need a bit of a refresher on this, it may be worth going back to your 400 notes. So the conditional probability with survival analysis is the probability of an event occurring at a particular time given that the participant had survived or had not experienced the event at the beginning of the time interval. So the hazard function is strongly related to the survival function. The survival function is the probability of being alive or not experiencing an event up to time t. The hazard function is the instantaneous risk of dying or experiencing the event at time t given that you were alive or had not experienced the event up to time t. So it's a conditional probability, conditioned on being alive up until time t. Hazard functions don't have much interpretations themselves. They are more useful as relative measures of risk. This is where the hazard ratio comes in. A hazard ratio allows us to compare the hazards between two groups. They have a similar interpretation to a rate ratio or odds ratio in that if the hazard ratio is greater than one, then the group you're interested in has a higher instantaneous risk of dying or experiencing the event at time t than the comparison group. And if it's lower than one, the group you're interested in has a lower instantaneous risk of dying or experiencing the event at time t than the comparison group. So for example, if we were comparing men to women, so women were the reference group, and the hazard ratio equaled two, we would say that at any given time, men are twice as likely to experience the event as women. Another example is that if we are wondering, for someone who's on the drug, what's the probability of them dying in the next year, given that they were alive, versus for someone who's on the placebo, what's the probability of them dying in the next year, given that they are alive? If our hazard ratio was 0.5, someone who's on the drug has half the hazard of death compared to the placebo group. Let's remind ourselves of the life table method. You may remember this from the first EPI course, SPPH 502. So with the life table method, observations are grouped into predetermined intervals, such as one week or one month. Censored subjects, so those lost to follow up, are treated as at risk for half of the time interval. Note that you won't be examined on the life table method, but it may help you to understand Kaplan-Meier curves a bit better. In the interest of time, and because you won't be tested on this, I won't go into any more detail here. But there's a great lecture through Johns Hopkins that goes over the life table method. It's a pretty good resource, so I would recommend checking that out if you're interested. So now we'll turn to the Kaplan-Meier method. It's a non-parametric method. Basically what we do is create time intervals of differing lengths, so that there's only one death time or event time per interval, rather than the possibility of multiple events per interval like with the life table method. This interval is determined by the event time rather than predefined, as with the life table method. I'll show you an example of what these look like, even though I know most of you will have seen these before. So we have time until death on our x-axis. Here at time zero, everyone in the study was alive, so 100% were alive. Each time you see a drop down, it means that someone in the study group has experienced an event. 
which is death in this case. The little notches or tick marks are censored observations, meaning that someone was lost to follow up. So we calculate each interval as the number at risk or who were alive and haven't experienced the event up to time t, including those who die at time t or experience the event, minus the number of events at time t divided by the number at risk up to time t. So for example, if we had 10 people in our study at risk up to time t and one person dies, this would be 10 minus 1, which equals 9, divided by 10, which equals 90%. And we can plot these intervals and events and use this to calculate the median survival time, or when this proportion becomes 50%, meaning that half of the patients are expected to be alive or to have not experienced the event. So returning to this example again, we can see that half of the participants in the study survived for 10 years, so 10 years is our median survival time. So let's take a look at an example comparing survival for two groups, those with prior radiation, shown in blue, and those without prior radiation, shown in red. The blue curve starts and remains well below the red curve, so this suggests that survival is worse in those who had prior radiation compared to those who did not. But we can also use these plots to find the median survival times, which I mentioned is when the proportion alive equals 0.5 or 50%. So just by eyeballing this graph, how would you calculate the median survival time for these two groups being compared? So I'm not sure what the unit of time on the x-axis is here, but let's say it's years. The median survival time for the blue, or radiation group, is around one year, and the median survival time for the red, or non-radiation group, is about four years. So this suggests that survival is worse in those who had prior radiation compared to those who did not. So you can see how we can use Kaplan-Meier curves to compare the survival functions of two groups. We can also estimate 95% confidence intervals for these, but a limitation of Kaplan-Meier curves is that it does not allow us to control for many other variables when comparing groups. We can't control for continuous variables, and we can't control for many categorical variables. So Kaplan-Meier is nice because you can plot things visually, but we can't easily control for confounders. And another thing to notice is that there are no coefficients with the Kaplan-Meier method. This is because this is non-parametric, meaning that we can't simplify the Kaplan-Meier plot into, for example, a slope. This is another con of Kaplan-Meier. If we fit a smooth curve through these functions, it would follow an exponential shape, decreasing. But a smooth curve does not always fit the data well. But the pro of the Kaplan-Meier method is that these curves provide us with a lot of information. There are a couple of key assumptions for the Kaplan-Meier method. The first is that individuals and events are independent, just like Poisson. The second is that censoring is non-informative, which we just talked about, and this may or may not be true. So let's look at another example. Here we are comparing the survival data for those over and under age 40. Those over 40 are shown in red, and those under 40 are shown in black. When we compare the curves, it does appear that there's a difference between groups. The red curve is well below the black curve for most of the follow-up time, and the median survival of the over 40 group is about half that of the under 40 group. So this suggests that survival is shorter or worse in those over 40 compared to those under 40 but we can also test this statistically. The first way to do this is to use the log rank test. With this test, we are comparing the Kaplan-Meier curves for two groups, but this test does not allow us to control for confounders. The null hypothesis for the log rank test is that there's no difference in survival between the two groups. The alternative hypothesis is that the survival curves are different. This is sort of like a chi-squared test. It compares the observed number of deaths for each group versus the expected if there was no relationship between survival and the explanatory variable.
Here's the R code for the log rank test, where group is the variable that divides your data set into the groups you're interested in comparing. We can see here that our p-value is less than 0.05. We can reject the null hypothesis and have evidence to believe that survival functions are different or that age group is related to survival. Those over 40 appear to have shorter survival time compared to those under 40. Those over 40 have a higher number of deaths than would be expected if there was no difference in survival compared to those under 40. But remember, this is not controlling for other variables. In the next tutorial, we'll turn to Cox regression, which allows you to control for confounders. We'll go over how to interpret coefficients and control for confounding, as well as the assumptions for Cox regression. Thanks for watching our video. Stick around, guys, because we got lots more.